Okay, Dr. Nassim is the chair for this um, session. Uh, Okay, we are live. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Ilyas Yanu uh, from Queen Mary University of London. He's a PhD candidate. Uh, yes, over to you. You have about nine minutes, so please try and finish uh, in your uh, allotted time. Thank you. Thank you, Nassim. Thank you very much. Um, I'm trying to share my screen. So can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. This research looks at blockchain applications in supply chain finance. It is uh, actually related to the previous presentation of Emanuel Gans, and it provides essentially a critical literature review from an operational, financial, and legal perspective. The blueprint of this presentation is, um, first I will uh, say a few words about the motivation of this research. Then I will uh, present the research question to then focus on the methodology, results, and analysis which answers the research questions. So, um, can you see my slides changing? Yeah. Great, great. So, why did we choose to, to research this topic? So, uh, according to Jessel and DiCaprio, up to 80% of international trade transactions require trade and supply chain financing. This means that if these transactions are not appropriately financed, will simply not happen, and this shrinks the volumes of international trade. According to the Asian Development Bank, there is a 1.5 trillion US dollar supply demand gap in the financing of trade, which is expected to exceed 2.4 trillion by 2025, according to the World Economic Forum. The situation is further exacerbated by COVID-19, which, which creates additional hurdles to supply chains and disruptions in the financing processes. So we are trying to uh, examine whether blockchain can provide a solution to these problems. In order to do that, we have identified three research questions. First, what are the key operational, financial, and legal barriers holding back innovation in supply chain finance? Second, how can blockchain support digital supply chain finance integration, and could it give rise to new and innovative supply chain finance solutions? So this research question examines the innovation-promoting role of blockchain. The third research question uh, relates to the implementation challenges. In this slide, I have provided a simple categorization of supply chain finance techniques. I will not go into detail. I just want to say that uh, supply chain finance is distinct from traditional trade finance techniques and methods, such as letters of credit, demand, gar demand gar guarantees, and documentary collections. So the methodology provides a record of what has been published so far in academic literature, along with an analysis of documents beyond academic publishing, such as industry-produced research. This has been supplemented by a desk-based research on blockchain-supported projects with a view to provide a solid overview for understanding how blockchain is practically being used in supply chain finance. We have uh, used three um, um, streams of keywords in our literature research. The first string includes blockchain and similar uh, terms such as distributed ledger, smart contract, or decentralized ledger which are sometimes used interchangeably in academic literature. The second search string of keywords includes supply chain, international trade, and platform-related keywords. The third uh, category includes finance-related keywords, such as finance and its derivative, and words from uh, specific supply chain finance techniques, such as receivables, payables, discounting, factoring, etc. That way, the second search string which is supply chain, trade, and platform uh, um, keywords, identifies papers that in this domain 
that always relate to both blockchain technology and financial aspects. This literature search resulted in more than 500 academic papers. Through a well-documented and scientific um, process, we have reduced, uh, um, we have selected some core papers, 29 in particular, to be included in the literature review, 18 of which were highlighted as core papers, which we analyze in the review. So the results provide the state of the art in both academia and practice. In academia, these are the 18 uh, core papers. As we can see, different authors use different methods to uh, analyze uh, the blockchain added capabilities in the supply chain finance sphere or um, numerical analysis. These papers also have different focus. Others focus on supply chain visibility, which provides a, um, a, a value in uh, a credit risk analysis, others on uh, anti-fraud uh, in supply chain finance, while others provide, suggest new financing models. The applied areas diverge as well. Some of them focus on traditional trade finance techniques, such, such as letters of credit, others on specific supply chain finance techniques, such as inventory financing or reverse securitization, other papers focus on specific industries, such as fashionable products or the auto retail industry, and other uh, focus on general uh, industries, such as the maritime industry. <clears throat> Accordingly, in the, the projects in the industry are also diversified. Here we have selected uh, 16 projects according to various criteria. A criterion was who leads each project, which could be either a consortium of banks or a technology provider. Um, we generally included the projects that uh, were identified, we, that we came across more frequently in grey literature. And this has been supplemented by my personal participation in many industry events organized by industry associations, such as the International Chamber of Commerce, the International Trade and Forfeiting Association, the Banking Association for Finance of, and Trade, etc., where uh, the industry discussed uh, industry initiatives, and these are the projects that came across more. That I came across more. This uh, industry and literature review enabled us to identify the blockchain added value in four streams. First, it provides end-to-end -end supply chain visibility, which is crucial for orchestrating supply chain finance uh, um, solutions. Uh, especially in uh, credit risk analysis. Second, it provides increased speed and operational efficiencies in organizing these um, techniques. Emmanuel Gunn previously mentioned uh, the paper documentation and supply chain finance needs uh, the circulation of documentation as well. This all can be automated through smart contracts. Third, it can reduce compliance cost, such as anti-money laundering, KYC, know your customer, customer due diligence and has due diligence etc costs finally it can mitigate the fraud risk which is a plug in the supply chain finance industry uh, through the increased transparency provided by blockchain the literature review also enabled us to capture some implementation challenges which again have been categorized into four uh, different categories first we have business implementation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, want to go. Uh, first, we have business implementation challenges, which relate to how we can align the interests of different stakeholders participating in the same platform. Second, we have managerial challenges, which relates to how to convince senior management and corporation to abort blockchain supply chain finance platforms. We have technical challenges, the garbage in, garbage out problem, and legal challenges, how to achieve legal enforceability uh, of digital alternatives to wetting documentation. Finally, our review also enables us to provide a critique and identify some future avenues of research. We can draw a conclusion from supply chain management theory, from platform theory, from network, network game theory, in order to uh, identify how we can solve these implementation, uh, business and managerial implementation challenges. More research is needed on the different technical solutions of the same type, and more research is needed on the legal enforceability of blockchain-based supply chain finance. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, it was a pleasure to present my work here.
Thank you very much, uh, Ilyas. I have just very one quick question. Um, the literature review that you did was, uh, did you just, uh, you just looked at the English literature, am I right? Uh, that is correct. It, it was one of the inclusion exclusion criteria. Uh, this is all well documented uh, in the paper, but I didn't have that space nor time to uh, present all this now. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So next up, we have uh, Rahma Al Zahrani. Rahma, you're you're ready to go? Yes. Uh, just a moment, I want to share the screen. Yeah, is it clear? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I'm here to uh, present um, our work, Blockchain Hosted Data Access Agreement for Remote Condition Monitoring um, in Rail Industry. Um, in this presentation, I will go briefly to talk about the remote condition monitoring of railway industry. And then I will um, highlight the problem that uh, triggers our motivation to do this work. And then I will go to illustrate the uh, proposed uh, framework we are working on. And um, at the end, I will conclude and talk about the next steps. Um, actually, uh, uh, remote condition monitoring technologies um, these days, we can't say that um, most, if not all, uh, rail operations are highly dependent on these technologies, as um, this technology will help in enhancing the maintainability and accessibility, and also the safety with the um, detecting and diagnosing of the faults that happens on the asset that relate to the infrastructure or the train assets a uh, long time before it occurs. And this will lead to what we call a preventive maintenance. Um, this kind of maintenance will help in avoiding breakdowns and all the costly failure and delays. So um, this technology, of course, depends on the sensors and the smart devices that is, um, uh, which are integrated continuously uh, and generate um, uh, a massive scale of data actually every day. And this data is gathered and then going through several um, levels of processing, um, which uh, variate from data acquisition that happens on the uh, sensors itself and going through manipulation, I say detection and health assessment, prognostics and help in making the decision at the end of these assets. And of course, the level of the data uh, with, um, with each uh, level process here is different and give different uh, indication that will help in the um, uh, maintaining the, the assets. And um, across different parties and sections of the indus industry, we will see that uh, there are different groups that may be involved in operation of an asset and provision the sensor and monitoring uh, of that sensor. So it's very common um, in the real industry to see that there is um, a train uh, sensors that's um, mounted but on the infrastructure and used to um, just monitor an asset that's related to that rain and also vice versa we can see um, some uh, sensors that is, that is mounted on the train but used to find the cracks and to uh, assess the the health of the infrastructure so actually the problem no, here, your, your slides are not moving we can only see the first slide Okay. Um, we, we we were only able to see the first slide. Try again. Okay. Can you see it now? Yeah. Clear. Yeah. So, okay. I will not go for the presentation mode, I will leave it as it is. Okay, so um, the problem we are trying to solve here is that the stakeholders that are involved in um, monitoring and operating these sensors might not be the one who is getting the most benefit from using these sensors as they are, we want to be, to be sure that the one who pays the cost of installing and 
operating this sensing hardware is also gaining some benefits from selling the data this sensor is generating. So um, therefore, uh, we have to assign actually a value to the data that is generated by one party but used by another one. Um, and actually, the, correct, the current uh, remote condition monitoring systems are working in data silos with very little industry level oversight of what data is being collected, who is using this data, and for what purpose and what benefit they are using this data. So actually, uh, can you see the slides moving? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, and actually this problem was highlighted before in um, the project T1010, which was um, uh, initiated by the RSSB on behalf of the Cross-Industry Remote Condition Monitoring Strategy Group. And the solution for this problem by them was a, 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 propo a proposal of what they call a template commercial agreement. But uh, this actually uh, agreement um, still um, have some limitations and we highlighted these uh, the most three important limitation is that they don't provide any um, mechanism for recording the evidence needed to enforce um, uh, the clauses of these agreements and also they don't address um, a robust communication support so that the data is made consistent and brilliable. So also we need a trusted third party um, to monitor these agreements and to enforce um, the compliance of the parties to these uh, agreement clauses. So um, we can look at it by uh, the figure uh, on the left side here, where they, the, the data provider or the consumer of this data is signing the agreement and um, needing the third party to monitor their conformance to these agreements. But also both of these parties will not have uh, a trust in the cost monitoring they are following. So we are trying to employ the blockchain um, uh, to move this uh, relationship to the right, uh, high, uh, the right side of that screen here, uh, where the agreement and the cost um, attribution should be automated and should be um, uh, generated automatically by the smart contracts. And the provider here and the consumer, there is no need to trust each other uh, as they are trusting the the blockchain and, and the um, the smart contract. So in our proposed framework, we are um, as as I said, employing the blockchain and smart contracts to work as a bridge between the data provider and data consumer. So we are um, uh, here. The data provider is creating and updating the offers of data they are providing to the to the to the network and also providing what we call a data hashes of these data also should be stored on the network data consumer can get all of these offers and select the one they need and uh, sign for it so uh, the data structure of all the metadata that we are assuming we are sharing here on the ledger is depicted here and we have uh, actually uh, guided by the T1010 project to um, determine which important data that should be stored on the blockchain. Uh, and of course, the, the real data should be stored off chain. It is a huge, um, uh, it needs a huge storage and this is not applicable in the blockchain for, for sure. So here we are um, uh, develop the model, the access agreement model so which is initiated by, by the data consumer who is initiating what we call an escrow um, in which he should uh, determine which offer he is interested in and he should also do the payment of this uh, data he's interested in and should also define the subscription period for um, gaining this data and this uh, of course this request should be sent to the sorry should be sent to the provider who is then so check all these elements and if he agrees with the um one uh, minute. Right. okay uh should also agree and by then there is an automatically generation of, of of the agreement between consumer and provider and also generating closing the screw between them um of course, the the accessing for the data should be, as I said before, on external storage. For the accounting model to, to find the cost attribution between them, we have also built a graph to investigate all the possible scenarios that could happen between the provider and the consumer. And based on these scenarios, the releasing of the escrow and the calculation for the cost finally will be 
uh, will be calculated and automatically generated. Uh, so for conclusion, we think this, um, the proposed uh, framework will help in translating the agreement terms into blockchain-based smart contracts, and we will um, uh, reach an automated and fair cost attribution between the parties. And of, co of course, this would help to uh, also help in the intellectual property rights um, the processing and integrity proof, proof data system. For implementation, we have uh, also made um, a trade of comparison between different platforms that could help in the implementation. And we found that Fabric, Aroha, and Sawtooth will, will, will work well um, in helping in developing this um, framework. For the use cases, we have also chosen a Braille BAM and um, a Pantograph use cases to be uh, tested against the framework after the implementation. Thank you so much. And if you Thank have you. any questions, I will be ready. Yeah, just one quick question. You mentioned about consumers able to decrypt um, the the messages and uh, and data. So, how would they do that? Is that in the form of uh, some app, yeah. user friendly? Yes, of course. Um, here, uh, accessing the data actually will be on external storage, and the consumer will gain access to the original data. The original data should be um, assigned and encrypted by using, of course, the public key and the private key um, uh, of the data, prov data provider and data consumer. So, yes, this data should be encrypted and signed also for further investigation. If there is any misbehaving in uploading um, uh, wrong data, corrupted data, this signing and encryption will be used later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Ranyu Shi. Yeah, hello, hello everyone. Uh, let me try to share the screen. Is it, is it displaying on the uh, stage? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yes, so I'd better make it full screen. Is it still working? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so hello, everyone. I'm the, I'm the Renvi Mandy from the uh, Warwick Business School, uh, University in the Warwick. So it's very uh, interesting to see everyone doing those uh, fascinating projects regarding the application of the blockchain in different industry sectors like the railway or the, uh, the the previous discussion. So in in my paper, I'm kind of jumping out from the uh, specific industry, but to uh, take a more conceptualization view to see how we can understand the uh, blockchain architecture as a whole. So this paper is uh, uh, proposed uh, adapted layered infrastructure design of the blockchain network as a platform by uh, studying a case of a bank. So we know that the digital platforms are everywhere in our daily life. Whenever you are calling a Uber, there is a Uber driver who is connected to the Uber platform that ready to uh, take your ride. Whenever you are using your uh, any apps on your mobile phone, there is some app developers on the other side of the Android platform that they develop this uh, services, these digital services to you. And whenever you are talking to the, your Alexa devices, uh, uh, hello Alexa, please turn on the lights. You will know those uh, innovation was developed by an anonymous or any famous brand on the other side of the platform. So we see the nature of this platform is that they are connecting different parties which are previously or uh, conventionally disconnected. But due to the existence of the platform, different uh, parties of the consumers of the developers can become to a common platform and uh, do the innovation here. So in the digital platforms literature, we have two views regarding such platform. The first view is we can see this platform as a marketplace 
So this marketplace is facilitated or enable the transactions between different sites, between Uber driver to Uber rider, between consumers to app developers. Well, another view is uh, looking at platform as an innovation infrastructure. So on an uh, Android platform, they complement her. The developers will have different platform resources to do innovation, to uh, develop really uh, inno uh, innovative, really uh, uh, funny uh, uh, mobile applications. And then they kind of release their digital product onto the platform. If we see platform as a marketplace, the first or the most critical objective is to grow the market base, which is to grow the user base of the platform. So the, the central idea uh, on the marketplace is we're going to initiate or we're going to promote the network effects to uh, attract the rider in the meantime to attract the Uber driver. Well, if we see it as an innovation infrastructure, what the platform operator or the platform owner is going to do is to provide uh, as many types as uh, uh, platform resources in order to facilitate such innovation activity. So knowing this uh, uh, in sense or the nature of the digi digital platforms, I found that the blockchain is kind of uh, reflecting or kind of uh, have a lot of the overlaps or similarities of the, to the digital platform that happen in our daily life. So if we see blockchain as a market, we will see like many different uh, uh, individuals, organizations, institutions, they use the blockchain as a product. Well, there is some like common value uh, goods uh, going through this uh, blockchain network. For instance, the Bitcoin we, we use to transact is that uh, because uh, they, they, the members in this blockchain network, they have the common agreement on the value of the blockchain or on the value of the certain digital currency issued by the uh, platform. So they adopt those common value good and to do some transactions through this blockchain network. So to this regard, the blockchain is a market and this market is facilitated as facilitating transactions. Well, we can also see blockchain as an infrastructure. So we kind of lessen our sense or the emphasis on the market aspect, but more look at the, the technologies uh, architecture designs perspective. So to this regard, the blockchain can be viewed as infrastructure that facilitate different innovation. Some innovation may be given to improve the, the, the sorrow out of the blockchain module, while other technology may be innovated around the, uh, uh, around the uh, crypto, uh, crypto, the digital key, the private key, those kind of the uh, crypto uh, encryption technologies. Well, some other innovation may be uh, emerged by using this blockchain as a driver or an engine to stimulate the digital transformation of their organization. So you see how blockchain can provide such uh, infrastructure value to the uh, our to the organization and to our society. And given that previous study has already explored many aspects on um, products view, so this study will focus on uh, to explore whether the blockchain can provide some infrastructural value to the uh, digital innovation in this digital world. So the case I use is uh, uh, a financial service provider from uh, from China. So it's a it's a bank in China, but it's a world leading bank with a lot of the sales. And you can see this banking is having very broad portfolio of their in their business from the insurance to banking to investment, and they have a lot of the subsidies to do innovation on different parts of the bank. And one innovation they have is using the uh, blockchain to transform the uh, banking's operation. Well, what they do is uh, uh, they use uh, uh, blockchain technology to help their clients or to help governments, to help uh, uh, monetary authority or help institutions to build a blockchain network. Yeah, with, uh, yeah, through which this blockchain network can transform their business practices. So the method I use is a semantic analysis. So it's based on the uh, text data uh, is like the qualitative materials. Uh, 
uh, I collected from the bank. So this is an uh, initial graph I developed for to demonstrate how this infrastructure is working. So it's a uh, it's organized by different layers, and within a different layer, we have some sub layers and within each layer we have different modules designed for that layer so it tells you that in order to deploy a blockchain network you have the fundamental layer that's targeting on the technical aspect then you have the interactive layer that you're going to issue different apis to connect to, to the external party and the external party can decide whether they're going to use the keys and apis to join an existing network or to explore to establish a new network and how this infrastructure is making value to business is when they be adapted to different business scenarios and during this process there is many environmental factors such as the government the regulation the standards that may influence uh, the deployment of this uh, infrastructure so the uh, the key contribution is I, I propose two views to viewing the blockchain network, which is one is product centric and another is infrastructure network centric. And I uh, develop and explore the blueprint of the blockchain network infrastructure and conceptualize some fundamental modules and the layers in this infrastructure in order to stimulate more conversation on the infrastructure design in the future. So that's the end of presentation and, and I'm very uh, liking to hear your opinions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ranyu. I have no questions, but I just wanted to make a comment uh, on the point you mentioned about blockchain infrastructures. Yes. As, and they are innovation centric. And yeah. that's where the, the value comes from. And there's a lot of research being done now on on the value proposition of blockchain. So yeah. not just the concepts that we, we know about, the decentralization and consensus and mutability, but also mm -hmm. strategic value uh, or, or, or where it comes from. So I think yes. uh, you, are, you are right that we know about blockchain. very good talk thank yeah thank you for the comment thank you thank you okay so our next uh, speaker is uh, joshua joshua <coughs> Eller from malta excellent thank you nasim um so i'm going to try to share my screen okay so you should see my screen and let me know if you see my slides in full screen Yes, we can see in full screen. Thank you. Excellent. So I'm going to be brief because of time. So the title is Blockchain is Dead. Long live blockchain. So 2019, post a lot of the hype, many people were asking, is blockchain dead? This guy used to write weekly posts, and now he's saying he hardly writes any posts at all about blockchain. And we saw these comments in various communities from the crypto developers themselves discussing whether blockchain is dead to just various articles saying blockchain failed before it ever began or people saying that blockchain was a tool that was just looking for a, a use case um so we're really interested in seeing did blockchain die is blockchain dead is it dying so this is what we're trying to establish now according to gartner the blockchain sector is in its trough of disillusionment now, if it were dead or if it was dying, it would at some point leave Gartner's hype cycle and it's dead, like other, other technologies that went down this path. And we want to establish how far on this path or this path are we actually. So to establish is blockchain dead, we need some way of coming up with a question that we can come up with answers to. And death implies permanent states of inactivity. We're going to use a looser definition. We're going to say if the activity of the blockchain sector substantially is reduced, then we'll conclude it's dead or it's on its deathbed. So is blockchain dead? The research que question boils down to, has all blockchain related activity been substantially reduced? So we look at a number of different assets from investments, investments, patents, academic papers, research funding, software de development. We're not going to talk about public interest, miners commitment and companies founded now because we don't have time, but it's in the paper. 
So we all know about the cryptocurrency hype in 2017, where we saw the prices of crypto go through the roof. And we're also seeing now that there's another bearish period, although it's fluctuating quite a lot today. So the question that we're trying to answer is between the period January 2017 and December 2020, did blockchain die or is it dying? And we have to admit that cryptocurrency is a factor of the blockchain sector. So we're not separating the two, but we have a single unified vision of what the blockchain sector is for the purpose of this study. We looked at a number of different terminologies to decide what various patents, what various co companies, investment to include in our study. And I won't go through this, but it's in the paper. So we start with investment raised between the period January 2017 and December 2020. We retrieve our data using Crunchbase, and that's because Crunchbase is a primary source for investors. And typically what a lot of investors do is every month they submit their updated investment portfolio um, to corroborate the data because Crunchbase also has some lag in its data when it comes to other aspects. We've also corroborated the data with another site, CB Insights, which has nothing to do with Crunchbase, even though it's uh, called CB. So we extracted the data of different investments for the period, and we see that we do see this hype affecting the investments, but we see that the levels aren't drastically crashing down. And this is corroborated again with the second data set we retrieved from CB Insights. And we can see that, is this a very similar graph to the hype cycle? Are we seeing an increase during the hype, a decrease, and perhaps a sober level afterwards? Perhaps. But an interesting point here is that investment firms employ experts to determine whether they should invest in particular technology or not. And post hype, they kept deciding to invest in this technology. So this is quite promising because these guys are literally betting their money on the industry. So from an investment point of view, we can determine that it's far from dead. And then when it comes to patents, we see a constant increase over time of patents being published. We retrieved our data using a SpaceNet because it's known to have the highest number of patents and also best features for searching. But the thing about patents is that they often take three to five years from the date of application until they're published. It can take a long time. So a number of these patents being published here could have been registered previously in the hype period. But that's not a problem because all of the patents that are published in this period, even though they were registered or filed before, now is the time when they're actually published, when the patent applicants have to pay for the most, the, con uh, the most cost consuming part of that patent. So all these applicants are still seeing utility in paying and securing that patent. So we're seeing constant increase in patents being published and costs being put behind these patents. So from a patent point of view, it's far from dead. When it comes to academic papers, we looked at various databases from Google Scholar, Web of Science, Scopus, EBSCO. There is some overlap between the different databases, but they do have some differences. And this is why we end up seeing rough differences in these graphs. Now, Google Scholar reports around the number of papers, whereas the other ones report exact numbers of papers. And the interesting thing is that we see an increase up to 2019, but either a decrease or a lower increase for uh, Scopus. Now, these figures, as most academics know, is that the indices take a while until they get updated. Google Scholar takes six to nine months until it might update particular papers. So we believe this dip over here, because the data was collected in January 2021, is due to this uh, delay in indexing. And we would like to revisit this to uh, in future to make sure that we see those numbers go up. At least that is the, the assumption. But even if it was the case that there was a slight dip, in regards to academic papers being published, the sector is far from dead. When it comes to research and development funding in the period, we collected data from UK's uh, Innovate UK public funded data set. And over here, we have the different projects that were funded and the values that they were funded for. And we see that towards the end of the period we're looking at, we're seeing more investments and also investments of higher amounts when it comes to research and development funding. 
Now, the interesting thing about research and development funding is that these are projects that are being granted. Now, all the researchers who are receiving this research money are going to be working on blockchain projects, are going to be publishing blockchain papers. So we're also going to be, see, be seeing an increase in papers being published. Now, this is but one funding agency. So obviously, we have to look into much more data out there from different agencies, from different countries. But at least from the perspective of the single agency, funding for blockchain is not dead. Now, in future, we want to undertake a more um, wider study in regards to different countries. You should so, go for one minute. Yeah, excellent. So when it comes to development activity, we find that we found 97% of the blockchain projects in GitHub. And we looked at their activity and we can see a constant increase, no effect from hype or no hype of blockchain based activity. So these are all the different GitHub events. And we looked at, we wanted to, to extract uh, a feature from this. We wanted to look at what makes a project successful. So we looked at the activity of a project, how long it's been active for its duration versus the number of contributors. And we find the more contributors in a project, the longer it is successful. So perhaps this is a message here that we should come together as a community and work collectively because that is where we're going to get success. But when it comes to blockchain-based development, it's far from dead. So future work, we're looking into various avenues for our future work to expand on, like I said. But is blockchain dead? Well, this is the punchline. Either people are wasting private investment, money is being wasted on IP, on uh, academics are wasting time on publishing papers, government funds are being spent on R&I, stakeholders and general public, because we also show that they're interested, are wasting their time, funds are being wasted on mining, because we also show that in the paper, endless hours are being spent in just developing software that will not be used, either that or blockchain is not dead. And we came up with this objective conclusion that the blockchain sector is seeing healthy activity in various aspects. Blockchain is not dead. Long live blockchain. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joshua. Excellent presentation. I have a comment uh, to make about the, the lag of citations that you mentioned. Yes, um, there is a system that we are using, uh, which is free for our JBBA authors it's called Artifacts. And you can actually cite others' work real time and it's, uh, it's on the blockchain, and it's free to, for use by the journal authors. So uh, please do use the system. We have one question from Dr. Sean Mannion, and he's asking about, um, are there any more granular breakdown by industry or use cases, for example, healthcare that you did? No. So for, from my perspective, I haven't found anything similar, and I think it, we need more work on sector-specific as well as facet specific. So let's look at r and in isolation. So it's both the facet and the sector. And I think this is some very interesting work that finally what this presentation gives us is the support to tell research funders out there, blockchain is not dead. We still need research funding. Whenever you hear say, someone say blockchain is dead, we need this sort of evidence to show them that it's not. Yeah, indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Joshua. Excellent talk. Thanks, Nassim. We have uh, next, uh, Final speaker, uh, Bedretin Gurkum, who uh, also presented his paper at uh, last year's ISC. Welcome, Bedretin. Over to you. You are on mute, Bedretin. You are on mute. Please unmute yourself. Hello? Can, can you all hear Bedretin? Just give a thumbs up. Or say yes in the chat. Um, no. Um, no. No. No, we can't. No, we can't. OK. Bedretin, I think you are on mute. Say something. If 
if you are using two are screens, screen, check if it is not directed to a different, directed to a different speaker. speaker. No, we can't hear. We can't hear you, Britain. Maybe some problem with your mic there. Try again. Okay. Can you hear me now or no? It looks yes. on. It's on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 It looks on. Okay. Okay. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Perfect. So, and then I know that how it is anxious, but thankfully they are good, and I wish everybody's family uh, good health. So today I would like to present to you implementation of the blockchain technology to the international trade and custom regulations. But since the Ms. Emanuel and the previous colleagues also present a similar topic, uh, I would like to give more uh, kind of summary details regarding the topic. So uh, first I am a lawyer and then researcher at the University of Szeged in Hungary in the third year of the PhD. Uh, I would like to give more about maybe the legal side, the problematic side of the blockchain to use uh, international trade. So as you know, the blockchain has three main promises as transparent, decentralized and immutable uh, infrastructure. So technically for this infrastructure, what we can use that we can use workflow across the parties of the trade. We can simplify the process process secure by design, transparency, and immutable audit trails. However, it is important to be in, be in mind that blockchain can track and guarantee the uploaded data is not tampered with. Nevertheless, not guaranteed that the recorded data is accurate, which is also kind of confusing for some parties. So how can blockchain be used on the international trade? The first thing is about the traceability. Uh, since the uh, previous colleagues also mentioned that there are some examples how we can use the blockchain, uh, you know that International trade has so many have so many stakeholders such as traders, governments, businesses, consortiums, insurance companies, such as. And technically, we can use the blockchain to share instant and accurate information for all of them, and then absolutely it will uh, decrease the paperwork risks and delay, and also the cost for the whole parties. Uh, if you give me, if if you give example, Walmart and WeChain is a good example. Uh, which in has developed in 2019, as Ms. Emanuel also mentioned, uh, across the food supply, supply chain, uh, such as producing, processing, transportation, and warehouse and retailing, uh, which is a kind of good example. Uh, smart contracts, which is a not new uh, new concept. Actually, it has came 10 years before from the Bitcoin blockchain uh, by Nick Sabo. Uh, the, technically, I would like to give detail about the smart contract that it is mostly legally binding contracts on many countries legislations because since there are parties agreed upon the conditions of the contract uh, which is the important part uh, first example that letter of credit transaction we can use the blockchain uh, on the left side you can see the letter of club uh, credit uh, procedures and the right side you can see through the smart contracts technically uh, smart contracts can be designed for the uh, letter of credit transactions also it is already has been made by the hspc and voltron uh, it is a word first cross-border yuan demonetated blockchain based letter of credit transaction uh, actually uh, it makes easier for the small medium enterprises uh, this kind of uh, developments because if there's a less bureaucracy and less expense than sme small medium enterprises is able to enter the international trade more uh, so one other example also other colleagues mentioned acceleration of the MLA and NYC procedures. Uh, MLA is anti-money laundering and NYC is know your client. Technically financing of the trade is the big, one of the most significant importance, important element of the trade. And then technical financial institutes are obliged to examine the parties under the rules of the know your client and compliance regulations. So technically the, it, these procedures take so much time, especially on these days with MLA 5, MLA 6 regulations of the European Union, 
it is getting harder and harder for small and medium enterprises to enter the international trade and integrate the financing of the trade. And then technically we can design the blockchain for MLA and NYC procedures as well. Uh, custom documentation clearance, actually in one basic international trade, there are so many documents as packing list, bill of landings, you know, invoices, uh, some filings, geographic specific certificates, such as. And then all this done by Manus cross valuation. Technically, all the procedure can be handled by the blockchain and then it can be also less corrupt for many countries. Uh, the example also Ms. Emilio mentioned that Mars and IBM trade lands uh, already have partnership with 90 uh, ports and terminals worldwide. And technically, the system uses encryption and permission based sharing key particles data shared on the permission private blockchain. So the technically commercial transaction on the blockchain as an example here, you can see, I don't, wanna, uh, I don't have so much time, I would like to show in general, technically the parties agree upon the conditions and then the conditions are coded to the smart contracts. And then there are some third parties are able to join to the uh, private permissioned blockchain and then check the procedure and then upon delivery, importer will, uh, importer will let the know to the other parties and then the payments will be made through the smart contracts automatically with that way. So potential obstacles to implement blockchain technology, technically it is a kind of our field. Uh, we are working on the most legal framework of the blockchain, which kind of legal barriers will will be faced uh, implementation of the blockchain, especially the first, uh, first uh, First obstacle is the technical ones, like there is no central controller on the public blockchain, but technically the private permission blockchain can be solution. Uh, also, there's another point that I would like to discuss how the blockchain is reliable or not. We are talking about a technology which is comp uh, relatively old. It is came from the 2009, almost 12 years old uh, technology. And then what will happen in case of the supercomputers? Nobody knows. Uh, but by today, it has been proved at least. And, and also standardization, as Ms. Emanuele mentioned, that which is very important because the technical countries will, uh, it, it will be important to get acceptance of the government and official bodies technically. And also uh, there are some uh, point that understanding of the blockchain and confusing by the cryptocurrencies is kind of maybe the problem. Uh, so the conclusion, uh, the technically blockchain provide transport infrastructure more accurate, fast and reliable. Uh, so many parties can join and can get the information uh, very quickly and accurately without any corruption, without any change, uh, which provides so much uh, opportunity. Private permission blockchain has provides more opportunity and then we will see that regular bodies uh, introduction in the future. So I would like to finish with the uh, writer Steve Brandworth. Once a new technology rolls over you, if you're not part of the steamroller, then you're part of the world. Uh, it is a references and thanks so much. Please keep in touch on LinkedIn or email and thanks so much for this great conference again and hope to see you next year face to face. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bedrashin. Um, I, uh, you mentioned about uh, governments and authorities uh, accepting blockchain as a as a as a big of big of challenge. Um, so, what what in your opinion are uh, is the solution to it? Um, is that something that you looked into, or, or any recommendations from your research on how we can get the governments and authorities to um, to accept uh, blockchain and distributed ledgers as potential solution for some of the trade problems. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the first step will be the, some uh, some chamber of commerce or some international agreements will be the long path. But for example, it will be a good idea to start with chamber of commerce uh, collaborations, let's say, uh, for example, also inside of the unions or trade unions uh, or it can be it can be added on the bilateral uh, trade agreements let's say uh, to make the trades easier between the country the country and i guess it will be the best and fastest way to start using blockchain between the governments bilateral trade agreements or chamber commerce registration uh, collaborations uh, or some trade unions uh, as world trade organization as well thank you very much any questions uh, from the audience? Any any general questions for uh, for the speakers? I think if there are no questions, let me check. Yeah. 
I don't think there are any questions. So what we can do is we can move on, uh, go to the lounge, and uh, start uh, our preparation for the next. Roman, anything to add? Uh, no, um, I think this this session is is come to an end. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So the next so, session is uh, the next session is on the law of crypto assets and regulation, and uh, okay. starting in in about ten minutes. So we'll go okay. there. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.